Thank you for coming this evening. It's wonderful to be here with you at the beginning of this Holy Week. At these lectures in 2006, Rowan Williams spoke of the cross as an example, as sacrifice, and as victory. You'll find, you'll find edited versions of his talks in a beautiful, beautiful book called God With Us, published this year, uh, which is in the Cathedral Bookshop. The example of the cross interprets God's love to us, makes it visible. The sacrifice opens the way for us to share in the life of God. The victory transforms who we are in this world, how we experience, and how we hope and pray and worship and live. In summary, the cross, and for that matter, resurrection, ascension, and Pentecost, call us to share in the work of God that saves the world. And it is around that theme that I'll be reflecting over this evening and the next two evenings. This talk and the two following it explore some themes not only for the church, but also for the country in which we live. The themes come from where I started with the person of Jesus, his life and death and what followed. They also come from our history, as a country that has found itself caught up in different times and different ways in the story of Jesus. For that story of Jesus runs through our history as through the history of the whole of humanity. In this country, examples are too numerous to list completely. They start, of course, here in Canterbury with St. Augustine in 597. They go through the civilizing mission of the church in the medieval period, the resistance to overmighty kings, the establishment of the rule of law in little chunks and pieces, starting with Magna Carta, negotiated by an Archbishop of Canterbury. They pass through the Reformation. The examples of the life of Jesus in this country are brilliantly lit and illustrated with heroes like Wesley by renewals and reforms. Christianity has been central to the history of what we now call the UK and of England, even when the UK or England did not know it was central, or for that matter, did not even exist. It is, in fact, the events of Holy Week that have determined all that history. Those events of incarnation, of example, sacrifice, and victory were so monumental that not only did they set a culture for our history, but they speak to our nation today of values and virtues and practices that are the right shape for us, even if we are not Christians. In a word, they set the pattern for what we feel is right. The account of Holy Week in the Gospels know this. And they know that this is the central story, not only for this country or the world, but for the whole cosmos. They want us to see the accounts of this week. They want us to see the extravagance of response, the radicality of the Gospel, that demand not only Christ-like lives for each person as they turn and seek Christ's power to be reflections of his love, but also those accounts demand transformed societies. And even the Gospels struggle adequately to convey that picture of transformation. Even getting some kind of handle of what a society looks like in terms of Christian heritage or basis, exceeds our grasp. It has been the work of centuries, with many stops and starts and errors, and much sin. It has been the work of centuries during which the humanity of the church in its witness to such a society 
constantly cluttered up the work of the Spirit of God through the lives of the church. We are, as Luther said, at the same time sinners and justified. When I'm at Lambeth every day, I walk out, when I walk out towards the gate, I pass an old, crusty, twisted fig tree. Still provides very nice figs. But it was put there with a cutting coming from the Vatican Garden by Cardinal Pole, the last Catholic Archbishop of Canterbury, in 1556. It is rumored to celebrate burning his predecessor to death. <laughs> Rowan will be glad to know I have no such <laughs> intention. It wasn't in my script. It's always dangerous to go off one script, but I did actually, the second time I went to see the Pope, you take him a present. So we, I took him a cutting from that fig tree and told him the background. He didn't say very much. <laughs> <laughs> Yet there are moments when the nature of changes in our country, whether we like them or not, offer extraordinary chances to take that narrative of what we've become and been, that Christian story, and to root the reimagination of our future in that story. For a while, every now and then, there's a moment when it seems that a door opens around us there is a way to go forward, and there's a chance to say to ourselves, this is what we want to be as a country at our best, and actually to have more chance than normal of making it more likely than normal to happen. At such moments then as Christians, we should put in our three pennyworth into the debate in our country. Happily, not being a theocracy, we can't decide for the country. I say happily, just to protect myself against the press tomorrow. <laughs> what I actually think, I won't tell you. <laughs> but we can paint a picture of human flourishing based in our Christian culture and heritage and in the life of the church as an icon, as an illustration of what we hope that our country could be. For the last few months, I've been writing another book. Uh, if you haven't heard of the first one, I'm glad, because I've been trying to keep it secret, and judging by the sales, have been at least moderately successful. <laughs> Having finished my first one, I said to all around me, if you ever see me start another book, you have my permission to lock me away. Well, either they couldn't find a good enough jail, or they didn't notice because there is another one on British values coming out next year. It was started after the Brexit vote, not because of rage or disappointment, but because Brexit seemed so important. And much of what I say tonight and in the next couple of evenings is based on that book. So at least you need not even think of buying it. <laughs> at their heart, these lectures are emphasizing what I just said that the single most important moments in all of history were in the events of Holy Week. They changed the whole way the world should work. And when there are great changes in our lives and country, then the changes of Holy Week are the primary sources of inspiration for the values that should shape us in the future. And so to start with this evening, I'm going to do three things. First, I'll look briefly at that beautiful passage in the 12th chapter of John's Gospel where Mary anoints the feet of Jesus. Then I'll look at why this time in which we are living today seems so important, given that for those alive, their own time always seems important. Finally, drawing on the story of Mary's anointing, on one or two principles I hope to draw out, I will try and draw some abbreviated conclusions on values, practices, and virtues. 
So let me just read you a bit of that story. John chapter 12, beginning at the 12th verse. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one that was about to betray him, said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this, not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. I only want to pick on a couple of points in this account, that it is ludicrously extravagant and that it does no one any practical good. Its extravagance is easy to measure. A denarius was roughly a day's wage. 300 denarii is in modern terms, allowing for annual holidays, bank holidays, and all the rest of it, slightly over a working year's pay. The average pay for a working year today is 25,000 pounds, or a bit more. This perfume was thus worth some tens of thousands of pounds in modern relative reward, some tens of thousands of pounds. No wonder they all stared. I was reminded last week by someone of a divorce case reported in the paper a couple of years back where one of the couple was showing what they required each month in income to live in the style to which they'd become accustomed, including cosmetics worth several thousand pounds every month. So it wasn't only then, it still goes on today. It was deeply extravagant is what John is telling us. It was extravagantly extravagant. It was ridiculously extravagant. It was pure gratuity, grace, an expression of profound love for Christ because she saw that, and if you'll excuse me, since we are talking about cosmetics, he was worth it. <laughs> Our response to Christ as individuals and as a church and as a society should be to be overwhelmed so that we respond ludicrously extravagantly. We are to be filled with love. And it has happened before. There's an example, for those of you who know this cathedral reasonably well, just downstairs in the crypt. Remember Samuel Smiles' words on the Huguenot Chapel beneath us? He said this, in, 18, in the mid-19th century. Still, he wrote, that eloquent memorial of the religious history of the Middle Ages survives, bearing testimony alike to the rancor of the persecutions abroad, the heroic steadfastness of the foreign Protestants, the large and liberal spirit of the English church, and the glorious asylum which England has in all times given to foreigners flying for refuge against oppression and tyranny. Well, at most times. What a ludicrous extravagance it was for the dean who let the Huguenots come on the basis of an exchange of letters. Imagine today that the dean and chapter were asked, where's the canon treasury sitting there looking shamefaced? <laughs> Imagine, Canon Trevorrow, that we were asked for a low-cost, nil-cost rent of a chapel for 450 years on the basis of a single exchange of letters for a non-Anglican group. <laughs> Commissions and regulators would rise as one. Lawyers would speak and write vociferously and expensively. 
the protests would ring throughout the land. But letting them use that chapel was a large and liberal spirit. It was Mary's spirit. But the anointing did no practical good. Jesus did not benefit from it. No time was saved after the crucifixion. We would have advised Mary against such a culturally noticeable and sexually ambiguous statement. I can hear myself advising her against it. A very warm-hearted Mary, but I do think you might just think again. <laughs> just before you go in. I mean, I can see lots of things you could do with that. And nobody is recorded as having their mind changed about Jesus as a result. Let's be clear. I am personally strongly in favor of plans and outcomes, and provided they're well prepared beforehand to get the result you want, I love spontaneous gestures. <laughs> but this one is different. It is a genuinely spontaneous outpouring of the heart, an expression of love and pleasure in knowing Jesus. Again, that speaks of what leads to human flourishing. Human beings are not entirely transactional. We are filled with passion, and when we reflect Christ, we overflow to the common good. And why does that matter today? Why is that story out of this great week so significant? Because what we are to become as a nation is at this time, especially, I want to argue, open to choice and decision. And thus what the church has to show in itself and point to in its advocacy and example, and remember, of course, the church is all of us, not the institution. What the church has to show and point to is the extravagant, gratuitous love that is the kingdom of God, and which even when palely absorbed into human society is the root and flower of human flourishing. The great periods of change and reform in the way that we behave as a nation have come from time to time, rarely enough, from a combination of huge events and overseas influences. We have never been just some islands off the northwest coast of mainland Europe. In the mid-19th century, the ferment following the ending of the Napoleonic Wars combined with the agricultural and industrial revolutions. At the same time, victory over France, especially at sea, had led to the creation of the Second British Empire. As more and more of the Indian subcontinent fell under British suzerainty, the demands of empire grew, for better or worse. It was a very potent mix of economic change at home and overseas development of power. It led to the reforms which began in the Great Reform Act of 1832 and inspired large...